Morning, everyone, and welcome to the launch of Cope Galway's annual report for 2023. I'd like to extend a particularly warm welcome to our keynote speaker, Dr. Sharon Lambert, psychologist and expert in trauma-informed practice. We look forward to hearing from you, Sharon, a little later. I'm joined online by Ashley McGellan, Vice Chairperson at Cope Galway, and Martin O'Connor, our Assistant CEO. Our Chairperson and CEO, unfortunately, can't be with us today due to other commitments. At Cope Galway, we invest considerable time in the production of our annual report, as we feel it is important to reflect on the year past, acknowledge the challenges experienced, and appreciate what has been achieved and learned. Perhaps most importantly, however, our annual report gives us an opportunity to share the experience of some of our clients, staff and volunteers, and to acknowledge the very considerable support of our community. Throughout this online launch, you'll get some insights into our work and impact. You'll hear about the numbers of people supported, some of the projects and initiatives undertaken, and how we have progressed our journey to embed trauma-informed practice into everything we do. In a moment, we'll hear from Ashling, our Vice Chair, and Martin, our Assistant CEO. We have a panel discussion with our heads of our Homeless, Senior Support and Domestic Abuse Services. We'll hear from our keynote speaker, Sharon, and we'll finish by 12 o'clock with some brief closing remarks from Martin. I invite you to take the time to read our annual report. This is where you'll find the stories of some of those whose lives have been positively impacted by Cope Galway this year. So thank you for taking the time to join us. I'd like to introduce you now to Ashley McKellen, Vice Chairperson of Coke Galway. Thank you, Sharon. A very good morning and welcome to you all. Being trauma informed is a theme you will read and hear about many times during this hour as we present Coke Galway's achievements and impacts from last year. In 2023, Coke Galway entered phase three of a training plan to embed trauma informed practice and care. Our guest speaker today, Dr. Lambert, created the training package, which has been implemented across the entire organization. All staff from administration to frontline workers attended the workshops. It's an achievement that I think reflects Coke Galway's ability to exceed expectations despite its scale. But what does this mean? Coke Galway recognizes that everyone experiences trauma in their lives and that it's likely that their clients have experienced this at higher levels than the general population. Understanding how trauma can shape behavior leads to a better support for both clients and staff in ways that minimize re-traumatizing people. In 2023, Coke Galway made a difference for 3,427 people in our community. This is an overall increase in demand of almost 16% across Coke Galway's homeless, domestic abuse and senior support services. Yes, we have to refer to numbers in our annual report we never forget that each of these children, teens and adults are members of our families, our friendships and our community. Martin will shortly speak to you about, about some of the people behind these impact statistics, whose stories emerge from a place of trauma, but follow a path of hope and opportunity. Let me emphasize that Coke Galway's impactful work was carried out uninterrupted, even while the global recruitment and retention crisis remained its biggest challenge in 2023. Our homeless service in particular was hit with severe staffing shortages. All of this was against a backdrop, uh, a background of a historic housing and homelessness crisis, higher than ever levels of reported domestic abuse and increasing situations when older people are facing isolation and compromised nutrition and health. Despite this, and this is something that consistently impresses our board of directors, what shone through these challenges was a steadfast responsiveness, professionalism, and creative thinking of Pope Galway's staff and volunteers, as well as the resilience of its clients. As you will learn from the staff accounts in this report, which Martin will go into detail on shortly, Pope Galway achieve positive progress for their clients because of a staff approach that keeps the client at the heart of what they do. The board and I wish to sincerely thank Pope Galway's highly skilled professionals, whose tireless efforts continue to meet the immediate and long-term needs of the people they serve. As Vice Chairperson, I wish to reaffirm Coke Galway's commitment to the strategic objectives that guide this organization and that shape this report. Over the past four years, we've adapted our strategy to meet the demands of an increasingly unpredictable world, working through challenges and seeing real progress in talent attraction and retention. The challenges ahead remain significant, but so too is our resolve. 
Our board of directors is committed to the highest standards of governance, transparency, and accountability. The 2023 annual report is structured to reflect these standards within our six strategic priorities and with an emphasis on prevention and early engagement work. Finally, on behalf of the volunteer board of directors, I wish to thank everyone who supported COPE in, uh, in 2023. It's thanks to your enormous efforts that COPE Galway achieves its ambitious work. Your generosity allows us to pioneer innovative initiatives that directly benefit the people we serve. I think what unites us all is a deep commitment to creating change and to supporting and empowering the people in our community who need it the most. Now I'll hand you over to Martin O'Connor, Cope Galway's Assistant CEO and Head of Operations. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, and good morning, everyone. Every year, the annual report offers a valuable opportunity to pause and reflect on our meaningful work and the profound impact this has had on the lives of people in our community. When you read this report, you will see that our people, our clients, our staff and our volunteers are at the heart of everything we do at Cope Galway. As Ashling mentioned, the real life accounts in this report are a vivid reminder of why our work is so vital. Each story of overcoming adversity and finding hope and despair is testament to the strength and determination of the human spirit. I will come back to this in a moment. Ashling has also already mentioned some of the challenges we faced in 2023, including an increase in demand for our services and many experiencing even more complex challenges in their lives. But today, I want to acknowledge what we as an organisation have achieved despite these challenges. Coke Galway's work in 2023 reached and supported 3,427 members of the community. Despite the ongoing recruitment and retention crisis, our staff and volunteers continue to operate our, fun, our full range of services, and as, a, as you already heard, did so uninterrupted and to the highest standards. We also progressed the implementation of new and improved approaches, most notably the further rollout of trauma-informed practice. Our homeless services provided 1,278 people with assistance and support during a deepening housing and homelessness crisis and found innovative ways to improve the experience of families and individuals spending longer periods in emergency accommodation. You will read in Martin's story how he and his colleagues at our family hub utilized innovation, not innovative ideas to work in a more trauma-informed way, emphasizing learning and mentorship. You will also read that last summer, a group of men living at our Fair Green Hostel devised and painted the City of Tribes Buren, a tribute to Galway. Our domestic abuse service responded to an overall 37% increase in demand including an 87% increase in crisis, call, crisis support calls, likely due to an increased awareness of the supports available for those experiencing domestic abuse. Not everyone in an abusive relationship needs refuge. Of the nearly 1,000 women who were supported by our domestic abuse service in 2023, just over 12% use refuge. Many women were provided with support in the community by our outreach team and through our support helpline. Elaine, in her story, talks about the rapid expansion and enhancement of the Solace Old Children and Young People Service in response, to client, in response to client need, from parenting support to boosting the resilience of young people. The service was developed, has also developed an educational programme that reached 600 young teenagers at 12 schools across Galway last year. Our senior support services engaged with 992 older people in 2023, offering social and healthy activities to prevent isolation and providing almost 83,000 fresh healthy meals, a 16.4% increase on 2022. The service positively impacts in all sections of our community with volunteering and employment opportunities, befriending and social inclusion programs and innovative meal developments by our professional team at Meals for Health. Kevin's story really brings home the scale of the daily service operated at Community Catering, with an average of 230 meals prepared and delivered each day. Thank you to the Coke Galway team, to our staff and our volunteers for making all of it happen. Now I want to take a moment to return to our clients. 
James tells us about his journey from what he calls hitting rock bottom after the sudden death of his mother, his subsequent homelessness, and his plans now to move into his own home and to enroll in a new course. Maeve tells a difficult story of physical, sexual and emotional abuse, which led her to seek refuge and safety and an empowered journey towards a safe and fulfilling life. Jerry, who loves to hit the high notes as part of Coke Galway's singing group, is the epitome of someone who is ageing well and who motivates others to remain active and engage in their communities. And Eileen and Sabina are great examples of people who value and pursue their independence. Thank you all sincerely for kindly and bravely sharing your stories. And to all our clients who inspire our sense of purpose at Coke Galway each day. So I'd urge you to please take time to read these very personal accounts so kindly shared in this report. Volunteering is central to the unique culture of Coke Galway. In 2023, we achieved another Investing in Volunteers Award, which demonstrates our commitment to providing a positive experience for our volunteers. I want to thank the 192 people who regularly volunteered last year and the hundreds of occasional and corporate Helping Hands volunteers. Each one of you makes a difference in our community. An energetic and skilled team of volunteers also make up Coke Galway's board of directors. I want to thank our directors for providing leadership, oversight and guidance, ensuring the highest standards of governance. The collective generosity, solidarity and support of our broader Galway community, individuals, businesses, funders, media and local partners, not only sustain our essential services, but allow us to pioneer new initiatives that directly benefit those we serve. In 2023, Cope Galway's income was 10.5 million euro. 77% of this income was funded by the state with the remaining 23% funded through philanthropy, fundraising and earned income. Details of our income and expenditure are set out in the annual report. We would like to express our appreciation to the statutory funding bodies and those individuals within these bodies at local, regional and national level who work so closely with us in ensuring that these funding arrangements are in place. Sustainable state funding at a level that allows us to attract and retain staff and that is based on a full cost recovery is vital to the delivery of essential services on behalf of government and at the standards required and deserved by our clients. We look forward to to continuous engagement with our state funders so we can continue to meet the needs of those we support in the community. We also want to express our thanks to our donors and supporters who enable the delivery and further development of our services. The philanthropic funding of Solis Og, which you can read about in this report, is a wonderful example of this. And now, to give you a further flavour of the impact of our work, I'd like to introduce our panel discussion. This is an engaging and lively discussion recorded earlier with our heads of service and facilitated by Alva Preen of our domestic abuse service. Thanks, Martin, and welcome everyone to our Cope Galway heads of service panel discussion. For the last 15 minutes or so, we have heard about the work of Cope Galway. Something that really stands out is how basic human rights are being impacted for so many. I want to ask our panel, how does our work address this? Gillian, I might start with you. Hi, Alba. Yeah, thanks a million. Um, yeah, I suppose our service, um, the domestic abuse service, that is why our service exists, um, is to try and make sure that women and children have a place of safety at home. Um, you know, home is meant to be where you are safe. And that's where we try to concentrate. Most of our work is out into the community where we have our outreach service um, that we deliver to meet women where it's safe to do so and help validate their experience to work, walk with them on their journey. <laughs> and to help them be able to identify natural resources so that they can stay safe in their own homes and hopefully feel that they can then speak to maybe family and friends about the situation that's going on. Um, therefore, if people need to end up coming to refuge, you know, we really want it to be the last resort because a person's safety and their home is the most important thing. Mm. Um, last year, 1, 000, uh, over 1,000 women came and met with our outreach service out in the community. And it just shows how more courageous women are coming mm. and knowing that something isn't right within their relationship and trying to change that and to try and get the get themselves back on the road that they would like to be on. Mm. 
Um, so we really work closely with them and our team goes out anywhere across Galway City and County. Um, unfortunately, then sometimes things escalate and people have to come into us in the refuge um, and everybody's welcome to, to come into us. Mm -hmm. And we're always there. We're 24 seven service to kind of hold that space for women as long as long as they need it. When Gillian talks about refuge, what's very interesting is that the women and children who are in refuge are not counted in official homelessness figures. Mm -hmm. So last year, our homeless services worked with 1,278 people, including 330 children who are experiencing homelessness. And Gillian made a connection between safety and home, and that was very big for our clients also. Having a home is not only about having shelter, it's about having a stable base, a safe place to be, somewhere affordable, accessible. And without having that stable base, people cannot thrive in life. And we've been working as homeless services over the last number of years to try to extend and expand our community based solutions. Our emergency responses are very much needed for people experiencing homelessness. But the volume of time that people spend in that emergency space is far too long. And we have seen the impact that it's had, especially on children, socially, developmentally, um, on their mental health and on their well-being. So we've been really working to try to extend our services, particularly those provided by our resettlement services. Thank you, Sinead. What might not be as obvious in society is that people's rights are also impacted as we age. Jackie, can you say something about that? Yes, the right to age with dignity is so fundamental to our ageing journeys. And um, part of achieving that is having access to good, nutritious food in a format that we can actually consume it and access it. And that's why our our Meals for Health social enterprise has developed specifically to address that issue. Um, we produce nutritious, delicious food, but we produce it in a format that can be consumed by uh, people in older age who may or may not have um, issues in terms of possibly swallow or um, just uh, needing the food to be in a different format. And very often that's not readily accessible. So that's really important. And um, another aspect in terms of human rights is that um, one of the most important determinants of positive aging is actually the quality of our social connections. Mm -hmm. And in our society at the moment, we are experiencing the highest levels ever of loneliness. Mm -hmm. And so in our community support work, we offer opportunities for people who live in the community to come together in social circles and facilities and um, avail of opportunities to engage with other people, mm -hmm. possibly having um, a meal together or um, engaging in activities, um, classes, learning opportunities. So those would be a couple of examples. Lovely. Thank you, Jackie. And that leads nicely to my next question. For the past few years at COPE Galway, we have been increasing our focus on prevention and early engagement in order to avoid people experiencing cr crisis situations. For COPE Galway, this work is often centred around addressing what is foreseeable and taking action to address and mitigate this. Could you give me an example of what prevention looks like in your service? Sure. Well, probably unknown to a lot of people is that um, our ageing journey is actually very much within our control, much more so than we realise. And um, in Galway, actually, uh, we, we just had Positive Ageing Week last week <laughs> and uh, we in Cope Galway, along with a number of other partners, put a lot of effort into um, promoting a more positive imagery mm -hmm. and narrative around ageing and our ageing journeys, because actually most people in older age do experience very healthy, happy and long lives. But that's not always what we see in the media. 
So uh, we try and get the message out there during Positive Aging Week and throughout all of our work that the earlier we start mm -hmm. and, um, you know, by focusing on some kind of core fundamental areas, we can actually have a lot of control over our aging journeys. Mm -hmm. And we support that in our work then, um, you know, in our meal service, we encourage people to think about um, eating well and eating nutritiously at the earliest possible opportunity so that they can um, maintain good health into later life and not just see um, a meal service as um, a need in a time of crisis. Um, and also in our community work, we, we provide, like I said already, we provide a lot of opportunities for people to support their ageing journeys mm. while living in the community. Lovely. Thank you. Something we can all take note of. <laughs> okay. Sinead, would you like to? Yeah, I suppose when I think of prevention and early interventions in our services, our homeless services are provided to individuals and also to families and there are residential and non-residential services. So I could come up with quite a number of examples really of that type of work. And there's two in particular that are springing to mind. And one is the tenancy sustainment support that is provided by our families team and by our resettlement team. So when people resettle into the community, they are provided with key working, care and case management, basic life skills support, anything that will support them to sustain their new home mm -hmm. and reintegrate into the community. I think that that's really important work because it prevents people from falling into cyclical homelessness. Um, and then in terms of services for children, we have a service called Helping Kids First. It's a project that's run within our wider family service. And Within that, we have a worker who works with every individual family and creates with each child an individualised child-centred care and support plan. And our, our worker, Jana, looks at the needs of everybody and considers their educational supports that they might require, social supports that they might require, and helps to link them in with community support and also runs a lot of really fun activities for children. Um, and it sounds like something that maybe wouldn't seem too important fun but um, when people are in emergency accommodation for long periods of time mm. they're in overcrowded situations quite frequently um, it's a very difficult place to be mm. and any fun and anything light that can be brought into the environment is so very important mm. so Yana sends the children to summer camps um, she links in and finds what each individual's child, child, child's hobby might be and um, connects them with those in the community and just works really hard to provide children with normal childhood experiences that they would otherwise be denied and in working so intensively with them to support their development we really strongly feel that it will support children to themselves have more fulfilled lives and brighter futures and hopefully futures where they will not be homeless. Thank you. Yeah, I think you can see that mirrored within our service as well. We have um, a schools program that goes out um, to, to work with children um, and young people to see what healthy and unhealthy relationships are. And when we're trying to tackle and get towards a, a society of zero tolerance towards DSGBV or domestic sexual and gender based violence, um, the young people are really the ones that are hopefully paving the way and um, are absolute advocates mm -hmm. for driving things like this on. Um, we've been lucky to be funded um, through philanthropy to be able to deliver uh, this across 600 students. Mm -hmm. um, and you would hope then that that has also trickled out to their friends and across their social media platforms. Um, and we went to 12 schools to do that. Um, another part of our preventative work has been the introduction of the Domestic Leave Act. Mm -hmm. um, that has shown it has shown that there's a real need that, to be able to talk better in the workplace, like people spend so many hours in work mm -hmm. and that might be the only place that they're safe. And to be able to have that conversation or know even by having that piece of legislation there that you can go and talk to your employer. Mm -hmm. So a lot of employers have come forward and asked us to reach out to them and to work with them and their HR team around how to be with somebody that wants to avail of their leave and to be able to name it, which I'm sure is, is a scary thing within work. But the fact that you are bringing in the training means that you are opening that that conversation. So we've gone out and done that. 
but also as Cope Galway being thought leaders when it comes to domestic violence, we realise that the five days that the government introduced simply aren't enough. Um, and therefore we've introduced 10 days. So we're, we're really kind of practising what we preach as such. And I think between the schools, between all the outreach work um, that we discussed, we really are seeing a lot more people coming forward mm -hmm. to disclose around domestic abuse. So in 2022, we had just short of 4,000 calls come true. And this year we've had over 7,000 phone calls come true, which is a massive yeah. increase. Um, so it's what, nearly 12 o'clock. So roughly about 10 calls will have come through already to our helpline. And there are 10 people that have reached out um, courageously mm -hmm. to kind of go, you know what, my life isn't what it should be at the moment and I deserve better and they do. And that's why we have the service that we have. And that's why we're really trying to get out there and into the community mm -hmm. to be able to make it more of a community stance against domestic abuse. It's not just a problem for domestic abuse services. Absolutely. And you touched on the wider community there, Gillian. What difference has the support of the community made to your service? The support across Goy City and County has just been phenomenal for our service. I mean, there isn't a thing I think that we've ever put an ask out for that we haven't got. Um, the support of the community has meant that one woman has been able to get her fridge for her forever home. Um, she was able to go in, pick whichever one she wanted and have it delivered to her house. Um, another lady has been able to get her locks changed, her windows fixed, stuff like that, that you know, we're, as a community, we are showing that, you know, what has happened to you is not your fault and you shouldn't have to be the one that picks up the price tag for it. So that with the support of the community, we've been able to do that. The philanthropy support to be able to run the service is just, I mean, we're after um, running our pilot programme in the schools and that has just proven to be absolutely phenomenal and the feedback from the kids has just been brilliant. So we'd be lost without the community. Thank you so much, Gillian. Okay, Sinead? I suppose one thing worth remembering is that our homeless services um, clients are Galway based people and they are a part of our community mm -hmm. and they are a community who very much supports our teams and our teams really appreciate that. I think we work great with the people who we serve. Mm -hmm. um, and then the wider community does recognise Cope Galway as being a Galway charity mm -hmm. and the support that we're provided with is absolutely incredible. Um, we have so much goodwill from the community and it's really evident in events like the Christmas Swim and the Business Sleep Out that are run each year. Um, the support that we get from the community really enables us to tailor the services we provide to each individual and it allows us to give more than just basic service delivery. It enhances our environments. We're able to upgrade our facilities and we're able to look at each person and what they might need and provide them with things that will help them in their journey through homelessness. Okay, thanks, Sinead. And Jackie, I imagine the support of the community is of paramount importance to the senior support services. Absolutely. Um, I think above all the services in Cope Galway, our, our service practically depends on the community. Mm -hmm. um, so, for example, um, in our Meals for Health social enterprise, we have over 100 volunteers and essentially without their daily support, mm -hmm. Uh, we wouldn't be able to deliver, produce and deliver the over 80,000 meals last year that mm -hmm. were that were delivered outwards. Um, also, while we do get state funding and mm -hmm. we're very grateful for that, many of our services, particularly our community services, have developed initially through the support of philanthropic um, entities mm. and it has given us the scope to actually um, pilot and prove the worth of our services and then be able to um, attract ongoing state funding. Mm. And what I mean by that is um, we'll say our Helping Hands Befriending programme, which which op offers an opportunity for older people who are confined to their homes to have a volunteer visit them. Mm -hmm. uh, we wouldn't have been able to start and run that without grant funding. And um, we also have great support from some of the local corporates in Galway. And particularly, um, we work in some 
housing clusters across the city, which is where a group of older people mm -hmm. live in um, like a small estate, mm -hmm. which which is built specifically for that purpose. But um, they find over time that they're they're unable maybe to maintain the communal areas. And mm -hmm. um, so corporates are coming in regularly to these housing clusters and helping to keep them looking nice and looking maintained and well painted. And then that creates a lovely communal space for people who are able to, you know, meet their neighbours and socialise more. So um, in so many ways, we, we couldn't function without the help of the community. Amazing and very hopeful and inspiring, which brings me on to my last question. Hope is one of Cope Galway's values and the importance of having hope can never be overstated. What gives you the most hope for the future? Wow, big question. <laughs> um, our society is ageing and we are also living a lot longer. And my hope for the future is that we truly value the role and the wisdom and the contribution of our older generation and that we are able to offer the supports that are needed if and when they're needed. And I can see that when we're in a position to do that through our work, I have seen evidence of the enormous difference that we can make in the lives of just one person at a time. So that's my hope. Fantastic. Thank you, Jackie. I think that that idea of that just one person at a time um, is also very true within the domestic abuse service. Mm -hmm. And my my hope is definitely in the women and children that I see that reach out to us and come. Um, they are just absolutely phenomenal mm -hmm. and they constantly inspire me and hold me to account to make sure that we deliver the service that it that is right and that they deserve. And with that in mind, then the, the staff team um, across the whole of the domestic abuse service, they constantly give me hope because every day they they work in an area that isn't for everybody and they hold it with such compassion and kindness and they are the first person maybe that that woman or child has actually spoken to about it and how they respond to that is life changing for that person. So as long as there's people coming forward to say what's happening isn't right and that there is people like the staff team there to meet them where it is, I have huge hope for what's going to happen in the future. Lovely, thank you so much. Similarly to Gillian Alva, the people that I work with give me great hope, um, both the staff teams and our clients. The people who we work with who are experiencing homelessness show great resilience and have been through such difficult times in their lives. But one thing that gives me huge hope is that homelessness is a solvable problem through the provision of housing solutions. And we have the great privilege at times of seeing people move into their forever home. That's the most hopeful thing of all for me. Thank you so much. I think that it is fitting to end on a positive note, a note of hope, hope for our clients and hope for society. Thank you all so much for sharing your thoughts with our audience today. Uh, I would now like to introduce a little video uh, with highlights of the year just passed.
thank you to the panel uh, and apologies for the uh, technical glitches just did towards the end of it. And thanks to the team for producing the video highlighting what happened throughout 2023. There's great satisfaction in seeing these snippets and the breadth of the impact of our work during 2023. And now I have the great pleasure of introducing you to our keynote speaker, Dr. Sharon Lambert, leading psychologist and expert in trauma. As you heard Ashling say earlier, Sharon developed the training package in trauma-informed care that has been key to advancing our work in this area across our whole organization. Sharon knows that world we operate in as she has extensive experience working with socially excluded groups in community settings similar to ours. Thanks very much, Martin. Sorry for, I looked like I was on a time delay there. I was searching for the, the unmute button, but somebody has done it for me. Um, and uh, uh, thanks for inviting me to come and speak today. And it was, um, you know, fantastic to see the, the just the huge amount of work that's being done um, across the service in so many different domains. Um, so what I want to talk about is, I guess, you know, so many of people who were, who were on this uh, uh session will know you know what trauma-informed care is but i i want to just briefly talk about what it is and and why why we should do it and and why cope galway is doing it so you know everybody who has spoken today has spoken about the context of the society that we're living in now so you know everybody i think has mentioned about increasing in complexity and we all exist within a context and every single factor of our lives influences each other. So the unprecedented housing crisis has placed a significant challenge on individuals, on families, on communities, and on services. And homelessness itself is a trauma. Uh, domestic violence is something that has existed for a very long time. Um, more and more people are coming forward now. Domestic violence is a trauma. And when we think about trauma, sometimes people think about what we talk uh, about the big T's, as we call them. So big traumatic events like, you know, as an accident um, or, or violence um, and all of those things are traumas. There's also what we think of as well is small T's, small traumas. So these are all day, every day things um, that can have a huge impact on somebody's physical and mental health. So when we think about trauma, we think about um, what is it that is happening that makes somebody feel physically unsafe or emotionally unsafe? And when we think about older people, for example, loneliness has a huge impact on both physical health and mental health. We know that uh, older people who are not lonely um, have reduced healthcare costs and they live longer and they have higher self-reported levels of, of mental health. So in terms of, 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 you know, so there are all of the reasons about why, why we need to think about trauma. Um, we know that some groups are disproportionately impacted by trauma. So an unfortunate aspect of trauma is that when you experience a traumatic event, it can make you more, more vulnerable to other traumas. So if you think about uh, homelessness, for example, and you talked about James's story, um, you know, so James experienced a grief and uh, that impacted on his mental health. Then he started to use drugs and he ended up in prison. Um, traumas can happen in prison. Traumas can happen when you're rough sleeping. James speaks about the conditions in which he was sleeping in, under bridges, in tunnels, um, and in sheds until he um, found a, a bed and was given a bed by Colt Galway in the Fairgreen Hostel. Um, so all of those things are traumas and they all interact with each other. So the reason why we're interested in trauma is that the science has never been uh, so clear now in terms of the impact of stress on, uh, and trauma. So there's been huge advance, uh, advances in brain imaging techniques. So we understand more now about the human brain than we ever did before. People who work in frontline services always knew this in their core. So people who work in frontline services, particularly in community-based services, so services for the community, in the community, um, always have always traditionally worked from a sense of, of community 
community and connection and compassion. And they knew in their core that there was something right about the way that they worked, but they didn't always have, you know, the scientific explanation for it. So what trauma-informed care has done is it has taken the neuroscience and the psychology and it has said, yes, uh, something as simple as being compassionate and providing connections, uh, providing emotional safety, all of those things have an impact on the way in which the brain is working and in the way uh, the brain is wiring, particularly for children. Um, so we know that when people have experienced stress and trauma, that it impacts on your feelings, on your thinking and on your behavior. Sometimes trauma is messy. Um, sometimes when we think about trauma, we think about you know, uh, those images that we can see of, of, of a, you know, a sad child sitting there um, holding a teddy bear. Um, that's one part of trauma. Another part of trauma is that it can make people very emotionally dysregulated and that can look like anger and people can be described as challenging, but they're actually really, really deeply distressed. Um, when we understand that, then we can create services um, that operate from uh, an evidence-based perspective. We understand the impact of stress on thinking. That in turn has an impact on staff. So when you work in a frontline service and you're working with people who are really, really, you know, in their boots and they're really, really distressed and, you know, you're you're getting up every day and, and you want to help people. And, and sometimes that can be really challenging. So when we have that framework of trauma-informed care, uh, it also allows us to to remind ourselves of when people are traumatized. Sometimes this looks difficult and challenging and that that reduces the burden of stress on staff. Um, we the, the science on on stress and trauma is really, really clear in terms of how it impacts on thinking and on functioning. And, you know, in a clip there where we saw um, about um, you know, the different services that are being rolled out. And one thing that jumped out, there was a couple of things that jumped out, but one was about, you know, when talking about children um, who are being supported because they've they've had to, their experience in homelessness or there has been issues in relation to domestic violence was fun. Um, when we have stress and trauma in our lives, um, it's it's a rupture. And when we experience that rupture, it activates our, our stress response system. And that's that's bad for us. Um, it releases a whole load of, of stress hormones. Um, and it's particularly bad for children because their their little brains and their little bodies are, are being developed. Um, so sometimes, you know, in a world that has become very output focused, um, we forget about the the things that actually matter and the things that actually make a difference. And uh, trauma-informed services think about those things. So children uh, under the UN rights of the child, children have the right to play. And more importantly, actually, is playing and having fun reduces the stress response system in the body. And it means that there's less impact of stress on children then, and it reduces the impact on their physical and their mental health. Um, another important, so so I suppose a lot of the work that I've been doing over the last few years has been talking about trauma and the amount of trauma that exists in our community, uh, how we design and deliver trauma-informed services so that um, people who, who, who struggle to use services, the people who are experiencing the most adversity in our communities can access services in, in a safe way. Um, and that's thinking about their physical and emotional safety. But one of the things that I've been thinking about in the last few years is that um, I wanna move beyond trauma. Um, I wanna to live in a society where we don't have repeated cycles of, of traumatized children becoming traumatized adults in traumatized communities. So one of the other things that Cope Galway is doing uh, is exactly what you're supposed to do when you're when you're you're thinking about trauma is thinking beyond trauma by doing advocacy work. So by going out into the schools and talking about relationships, that's saying we want to move beyond trauma. Um, having support plans, key working case management systems and um, means that you want to have a whole system that supports uh, children and families and older people so that you can move beyond trauma. So I want to finish on some words from James, um, because I think that, you know, James gave his story of experience and of, of his grief 
um, managing his mental health difficulties with drugs, ending up in homelessness, and now being at a point where he has returned uh, to education and he he wants to to pursue a career in youth and family support work. So James said, I didn't know how to be kind to myself emotionally or physically. I didn't want to be alive anymore. And when he arrived at Fair Green, the person who greeted him was so kind and so friendly, and he'll never forget that moment. It just felt like something had lifted. I immediately felt safe. And no human being will ever reach their full potential if we don't create environments where they feel safe. So when people don't feel safe, they have physical health issues, mental health issues, and other social problems. And that costs a lot of money. It has a, a personal cost to the individual and it has a cost to the state. So by giving full cost recovery to organizations that create that safety, we reduce costs across other systems. Um, so thanks uh, for having me and uh, huge congratulations to Coke Galway for all of the work that they have done um, over the last year and, and for their plans for the, for the next few years. Thank you very much, Sharon. I think you touched on it there in, ter in terms of saying to focus on the things that matter and things that make a difference. And that's very encouraging us to hear for us to hear. And that's why we're on the journey to becoming a trauma-informed organization in our work and why it's so important. And the value that this approach will have in making a positive impact on people's lives and the communities that we live in. So now, as we conclude our annual report launch, I would like to acknowledge the power of connection we share with the Galway community as we work together to make a difference. Whether you helped fund our work, whether you've been a supporter for several years, whether you stepped out to raise vital funds, donated at Christmas, or contribute every month, whether your team tidied a garden, you braved the cold Galway Bay waters, or prepared a nutritious meal, whether you've worked or volunteered with us for, several, for a few weeks or for several years, we thank you sincerely. Cope Galway is built on a foundation of community spirit and the, the belief that together we can make a significant difference in the lives of people who need support at a difficult time in their lives. Our work depends on this support and is evident throughout this annual report. As you review our accomplishments over the past year, we hope it reignites our shared commitment to pursue a more just and compassionate world. Working together, we hold on to our vision for a community where every person is valued, cared for, and supported at every stage of life. Thank you.